Share screen. Review commands. So, Sorry, whoops. I'm going to ask my normal question. Can everybody see the slides? That, well, can you see the slides? Yes, bro. Yes. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Yes, Excellent. Bro. Okay, so today we're going to talk about pediatrics. Well, this morning we're going to talk about pediatrics. Um, now, you may have a big or small pediatric practice, but it's still worth um, just considering some of the special um, scans and arrangements we need for pediatrics. So the general principles are um, we need to try and image the child in a child-friendly kind of department. So um, depends on the number of pediatric patients you have. There are various strategies for this. Some departments have a sort of pediatric day or half day, and they will, may get out um, some cleanable toys, pre-COVID anyway. Post-COVID, it's more difficult. Uh, um, maybe have the use of a play therapist to help explain procedures. But for departments that have um, pediatric patients every day, then you may just have a part of your waiting area, uh, which is much more sort of pediatric friendly. Mm. Um, obviously, we can't inject the same activity as we do for adults. So the general rule is, is that we use a proportion of the adult activity so if it's a 35 kilogram child would use half but there is a minimum because obviously um for smaller babies and, and infants we still need to get enough activity to see something so there is a 10 percent minimum activity so for example in the uk the legal limit for a bone syntigraphy is 740 megabecquerels of mdp and therefore for a child the minimum is 74 megabecquerels now, obviously, children can be quite anxious and nervous. Um, their parents can be pretty much anxious and nervous too. So there are uh, little techniques that can be used to help to try and make it um, less of a problem for both the children and adults. And this includes using local anesthetic cream. Um, this can be uh, obtained by the um, parents locally or we can be sent out through the post, for example. Um, you may want to consider sedation. This may be appropriate with some children. Generally, sedation is not brilliant at uh, sedating children. Um, sometimes I think it would be better if the parents took the sedation. Um, for very small babies, um, milk is a brilliant sedative. If they've got a nice full tummy, they tend to fall off to sleep. So it's certainly in the first six months, um, if appropriate, a feed before a scan works well. And it may be that you need to uh, perform a general anaesthetic. And we tend to find these are patients who, for example, are um, maybe have been in and out of hospital many times because they have, for example, a childhood cancer and find the whole process very distressing. And we may need to use a light general anaesthetic. So again, you may need to have sessions booked where you can have the pediatric anaesthetist available. So that's the sort of general principles. Uh, we're going to talk, um, so there's a few things missing off this list. We will talk about more than just kidneys and, and milk scans, but that's the start. Um, so renal cortical imaging, we discussed a little bit in the um, renal talk, but this is going to be a little bit more, um, some more examples of detail for, for pediatrics. So as we know from when we did our renal talk, this agent is filtered by the glomerulus and then reabsorbed in the tubules. So effectively maps working nephrons. Um, now gluheptinate is used in North America uh, and DMSA is pretty much used in the rest of the world. But if you're reading something from North America, you might come across glucoheptinate. 
they're very similar except the fact that you get much better resource with DMSA. For some reason, the Americans have been very slow getting DMSA licensed. Um, nearly always we would do plain imaging and for children, plain imaging with DMSA is quite sufficient because generally children are quite small, so attenuation is less of an issue. Acute changes can look like scars, so um, we do um, ask patients to wait after a last UTI. Uh, the minimum is three months, but to be honest, it's best to be six months. Now, the problem is some of these children have intermittent UTIs and it can become quite a problem. We've had patients delayed up to 18 months. If that's the situation, you may need to discuss with the referring clinician and agree that um, the child may go on to long-term antibiotics and you will just try and scan the patient at some point uh, with the understanding that there may be some acute changes related to a recent UTI and just get on with it. Um, but that will be in your report as well. And what we may do is do two scans a year apart just to see if there's any acute changes. Um, so image acquisition, um, for very small children, um, then we don't tend to use the camera bed, we tend to use the, um, just lay the child onto the um, collimator. Now that may mean turning off the collimator collision system to do that. Uh, another very, very good tip is to always have an incontinence pad underneath the child because you can guarantee that um, they may just try and pee radioactive DMSA otherwise whilst you're scanning. In terms of getting a good quality um, image, the key is to try and keep the child as still as possible. And as we know, the acquisitions tend to take around about at least three or four minutes to get about 600K counts. Um, and that is where the parent or carer is important because if they can um, hold the child um, in a not sort of forcing the child down, but reassuring them, and particularly by sort of laying a hand on their tummy. Now they will get a bit of a small radiation dose of their hand, but that's not really an issue, um, even if the parent or carer is, is pregnant. Um, but it doesn't really matter so much if they move their arms and legs, as long as they keep their torso nice and still. Uh, and also, um, Many systems now for a DMSA actually acquire not a static image, but effectively a dynamic image, and then use software to build a, a static image uh, with, with a motion correction. What we want to see is a little bit of the internal structure of the kidney. So you can see here, there's some areas which are, are lighter gray, and this is the, the collecting system, and this is a nice high quality image. As you can see, it's a fairly small patient. I would probably guess this patient's about one and a half. So it is possible to get good quality pictures. Uh, as we show, showed previously, um, you know, we can see these um, normal variants and the horseshoe kidneys. Um, horseshoe kidneys are variably um, common, but maybe about as much as 1% of patients will have some degree of horseshoe um, kidney. Um, and the thing about the horseshoe kidney is that um, the me middle of the kidney lies in front of the aorta, so it's an anterior structure. So uh, you might get a better view of quite a lot of the kidney from the anterior view, which you wouldn't for normal uh, native kidneys. Um, and the anterior bleaks are also quite nice as well. And as I said, if you want to look at divided function, you have to try and decide exactly where you're going to go for your left and right divided function and try and be consistent between scans. Another variant which is slightly less common, but what you can see is this thing called cross-fused ectopia. Now, if you remember your embryology, um, the sort of the, the kidneys evolve in the pelvis and move up into their position in the, um, the loin, but um, sometimes the two sort of renal buds start off on the same side. And what you do is you effectively get two normal kidneys, one on top of the other, and they actually sort of fuse together. So you get this thing called cross-fused ectopia. 
And again, to get a good view of it, we would recommend doing a posterior and anterior view because one of the kidneys may lie more anterior than normal. Um, they have, probably have a slightly increased chance of scarring compared to normal kidneys. One of the patterns that you do need to be aware of is this situation where you get diffuse scarring. So whilst we're commonly used to seeing a single or uh, multiple sort of punched out scar in the kidney, you can get patients, particularly those who suffer multiple urinary tract infections, where you just get some diffuse changes. And so what you see is not a kidney necessarily with big defects, but the kidney is just smaller and has less uptake. Uh, and this is just as important as um, spotting a, a focal defect. Now, there could be other causes for that. For example, um, sometimes obviously kidneys may just develop asymmetrically. But in a patient who has repeat um, UTIs, um, I think we have to suspect that this is due to um, the patient having scarring. And in fact, if you look at the oblique image, you can see not only is that kidney smaller, but there is definitely a discrete scar on there. So this one, I think, would be fairly easy. Um, and it, this is the same patient was scar scanned two years later, and you can see that that right kidney has shrunken even further and now looks very abnormal. And unfortunately, the kidney that was normal now has a scar as well. So um, it is important to try and... Um, uh, make sure that you uh, report that appearance as a positive scan or certainly a scan that is uh, concerning. And again, um, in your language, be careful what the, when you see a defect. So we assume this defect is a scar, but let's say this child has repeat UTIs and we can't get a six-month period that's clear. So let's say this could be two months after the last urinary infection um, so then you wouldn't call it a scar you just call it a defect and you would recommend rescanning in a year's time uh, to see if that turns into a scar and it's quite okay to use the word defect instead of scar as you know if you don't correct stuff it tends to get worse um, so this is a uh, the end result of um, reflux not being corrected and the patient's having repeat UTIs. So in this situation, this left kidney is very small and shrunken with only 12% of total renal function. Um, once the divided function drops below 15%, then um, that kidney, as we said earlier, will start producing a, a lot of um, renin angiotensin and um, this will result in the patient getting hypertension. So that kidney needs to come out. Um, between 15 and 20%, it's a bit more equivocal. Um, but this kidney is never going to recover, and it could cause problems. Now, DMSA uptake itself is obviously dependent on having some decent renal function. So in patients where there is a degree of renal failure. And this is actually a um, patient who has a degree of acute renal failure. Now, acute renal failure in children can occur in a number of situations. Again, fortunately, in the majority of children, it's a self-limiting condition, but can be related to things like hemolytic uremic um, syndromes. Um, and again, we're not sure why these happen, but a lot of them can be related to viral infection triggers. And we may see this with COVID, to be honest. Um, we just don't know yet because we haven't had enough experience as it tends to occur about six months after the um, viral illness. We certainly see it with parvoviruses. And when you have impaired renal function, then the glomerular filtration rate is reduced. And that means you're not filtering the DMSA to start with. So you have this um, high background activity and this is in, the, in this posterior image, you can actually still see blood pool. And this is at three hours, so there shouldn't be any blood pool at three hours. Um, now, in this um, patient, you can say that both kidneys are present. They look are roughly about the right size, 
roughly about the right shape, but you're not getting much detail. So be very careful about trying to describe whether or not they have scarring or not. Um, it may be the case that you're asked to look at a patient who has um, a hydronephrosis. Uh, and one of the reasons you may be doing this is because um, in patients who've had gross hydronephrosis, um, they may want to, to work out uh, an accurate method of assessing divided function. And the problem with, with large kidneys and small people is that there are um, errors in the MAG3, which tends to be only done with the posterior acquisition. So if you could do a DMSA, and particularly if you can get an anti and posterior image and do a geometric mean, you will have an idea of residual renal function, which is a bit more accurate than you can even get off a renogram. Now, bizarrely, despite the fact this kidney looks very abnormal, um, it may still be contributing a significant amount of renal function because obviously all the, the nephrons have been splayed out, but they're still present. So again, this may be used as a decision to decide whether or not the, this kidney should be removed. So if they're considering an nephrectomy, then a, a DMSA can be very useful. So let's um, go somewhere else. Let's go to something which is definitely only occurs in pediatric patients, and that is the milk scan. So uh, this is to look for gastroesophageal reflux in babies, and there's different levels of reflux, as you know. Uh, some of it will just end up by causing uh, distress post-feed because they'll get some esophagitis, but it is possible that if it's significant that you can get um, aspiration and then an aspiration pneumonia. Um, now, the way you can do this is to feed the baby. Um, now, clearly, we can't inject the mother with the colloid to get breast milk. We need to express the breast milk, and then we'd need to label it and then feed the baby, just in case anybody uh, was in doubt. Uh, obviously, we can use any kind of baby formula that's appropriate to the child's age, but these tend to be quite small babies. Um, we give them a feed and then we image them over 30 minutes and we look for reflux. And again, the same rules is that it's often best to lay the baby on their front um, directly onto the gamma camera to get the best pictures. So here we have a series of images. This is over, uh, these are 30 second frames. So each frame is 30 seconds and not a lot happens. There's a little bit here happening at around about... Um, seven to eight minutes, then it all goes back into the stomach, but we get quite significant reflux occurring here. And I've just expanded these three panels so you can see quite extensive reflux. Now, um, when it's at its worst, you then can see um, reflux into the um, uh, lungs as well. And we hope we don't see that, but it is possible. And again, like all reflux studies, it can be intermittent. So a negative study doesn't actually necessarily rule out um, reflux. It just rules out reflux on that particular day, on that particular time. And so you may need to repeat the study. Um, there was a very nice review from Boston Children's of quite a long time ago now, um, even before I did nuclear medicine. Um, demonstrating that the milk scan was more sensitive than barium. And the reason being is that barium, um, or even gastrographin, is quite thick. And so it doesn't sort of reflux as much. Uh, and as you can see, the, the, the worst grade, grade five, goes into lungs. I think that previous patient I will probably put down as a grade four because it pretty well reaches the top of the esophagus. Um, but there are other ways of doing it, which is why we don't do so many milk scans now. Uh, you can look for milk lipids in macrophages which are obtained in the lungs by bronchoscopy or you can uh, they can use um, pH monitors now to pH, see if there's low pH on bronchoscopy and they can do these little baby bronchoscopies which tends to be the way they tend to do it more than milk scans but some centers may still be doing milk scans and if you think about it, it is a quite a nice non-invasive test I think it's just um, less popular than it was so, Meckel's diverticulum. I did promise you Meckel's diverticulum. So, um, here we go. Who was Meckel? Anybody got any ideas? 
So, um, well, if you don't know who Meckel was, then you're in good company because nobody knows who Meckel is. You may think this is very strange, but um, the Meckels were, there were three Johannes Meckel. There was um, a father and son, both called Johannes, and very strangely, the father's brother was also called Johannes Meckel. Very confusingly, they all worked out of the same practice and they all worked around roughly the same time, which was sort of 1790s to the 1820s. And one of them wrote the paper describing Meckel's diverticulum, but nobody knows which one. So if somebody tells you who was Meckel, you can, you can actually say you don't know. And that is the correct answer. Um, but actual Meckel's diverticulum is very common. It occurs in about 40% of the population and can occur anywhere from the pylorus to the anus. But most of them are near the junction of the jejunum and ilium or in the ilium. Now, to be pathological, you don't just need to have a Meckel's diverticulum. You need to have a Meckel's diverticulum with ectopic gastric mucosa. Now, that is actually rare. And they did a review from Denver Children's Hospital. And in 20 years, they did over 2,000 Meckel studies and they had 12 positives. So um, you can see that it's not particularly common. And when they reviewed the positives, they noticed that there are a few things. Normally, they were under two. So uh, it, it, this is, tends to be something which occurs in younger children. The most common symptom was pain following food, food and eating. So children didn't like to eat because they got pain. And that pain radiated to the center of the abdomen. The next most common symptom was obstruction. Um, in fact, of a non-symptomatic non uh, Meckel's diverticulum obstruction can occur. It can be a... a cause of an interception for example bleeding uh, which often people's put on the request form was present in less than 20 percent of patients with a positive study as was anemia so it, it it's really the pain that's the key positives rare over the age of five but there are some people who manage to get into adulthood and still have an undiagnosed um, active meckles so this is what one looks like this is actually uh, from a surgical um, review and you can see there's a definitely a diverticulum and at the end you can see there's some abnormal tissue and this is where the gastric ectopic mucosa is and this releases obviously um, acid which can then um, affect the wall of the the gut so Again, it's ideal that you do a four-hour fast. And the four-hour fast is designed to try and stop stomach contents coming down into the small bowel. To try and reduce gastric movement of activity even more, then you can use an H2 blocker such as cimetidine, uh, which you give about 30 minutes before the scan. But you do obviously you don't use PPIs like omeprazole because clearly that will stop the excretion of the tracer through any gastric ectopic mucosa. Um, we try to make sure that we see uh, everything from the stomach down to the anus. Uh, fortunately, if they're smaller children, this is not difficult. And again, for younger children, you can use the line on their tummy on the collimator trick. Do a dynamic with um, 30, 60 second frames and then um, at least 30, um, 60, 30 second frames. So around about a 30 minute acquisition. You can go a bit longer, but the point is you're looking for uptake that appears at the same time as the gastric mucosa. And the peak for that tends to be between about um, five and 20 minutes. So if you're going much beyond um, 30 minutes, um, in your pickup rate is going to go down. It might be worth, if you think there's a little blush or something, you want to see if it gets more 
that you might want to carry on imaging um, or if it's negative and you really think the patient has got symptoms it might be worth carrying on but it's really not worth going on beyond 60 minutes the problem is by 60 minutes then betetnotate has come through the stomach wall and is in the stomach and even with cymetidine and fasting it will start to travel down the bowel and it, um, activity will appear that will obscure and I think so what you want to be looking for is uh, uptake appearing at the same time as stomach mucosa, uh, and it may again gain only occur in a couple of frames, so you need to review the dynamics. Uh, sometimes if it's in the part of the abdomen, which there could be renal activity, because obviously protectinotate is excreted to some degree through the kidneys, you may want to do a lateral view as well. So this is um, a classical uh, positive, this is quite a nice positive. You've got activity here in the gastric mucosa. You've got a bit of blood pool. You've obviously got urinary activity because it is filtered for tetanate. And here by the red dot is an area which is out of the line of the ureters, is away from the stomach. So this would be classically the site of uh, ectopic gastric mucosa. And the, not the majority, but the most common site is in the right iliac fossa, where it can symptomatically be confused with appendicitis. So biliary atresia. So biliary atresia is um, effectively a medical emergency. It's a cause of neonatal jaundice. Um, and the problem is, is that if the jaundice doesn't settle after 10 days, so... Um, a significant number of babies when they're born um, related either to trauma at birth or change in haemoglobin. As you know, the haemoglobin that occurs in neonates is different from adult haemoglobin and that transfer um, can result in quite significant hemolysis and um, subsequent mild um, jaundice. Um, and it's so common, as you know, that many um, Baby units have a blue light system to help break up the jaundice quite quickly. Um, one of my two children had a bit of jaundice at birth, so it's very, very common. However, if that doesn't settle after 10 days, you need to consider two different situations. One is this thing called Gilbert's disease, which is basically a defect in the chemical handling of bilirubin, but the bilirubin wouldn't get worse. And the second one is biliary atresia. And the problem is if it doesn't get corrected by three months, you get damage to the brain called conicterus, particularly to the basal ganglia. So um, CASI, um, a pediatric um, gastroenterologist in Japan, has identified these different types. So here, the, the green bits are the normal bits and the red bits are the atresic bit. And the most common one is type 1, where you have... Um, uh, malform the common bile's out between the um, bile uh, where the gallbladder comes on the, um, the um, uh, pancreas and that's the easiest one to treat of course because you can just basically plug uh, on um, the common bile duct via the gallbladder onto the the small bowel the more complex ones are have uh, defects within the liver and they're the type twos and type threes but all of them will show similar appearances on a uh, HIDA scan. So if you're going to perform the study, obviously we should use now third generation HIDAs, which I think probably the only ones that are available. Now, um, with Gilbert's, because we said it was a biochemical situation, it's basically a lazy liver. So um, you can stimulate it by giving some phenobarbitone, an uh, old-fashioned drug, but low dose of phenobarbitone um, will try to make sure that any Gilbert's doesn't result in biliary stasis. <clears throat> so we asked for 48 hours of phenobarbitone. Has the added advantage that the child is much easier to scan with a little bit of phenobarbitone on, remembering it is a, a sedative. Um, we inject activity related to weight uh, but to be honest, these children tend to be very small um, because they're not really thriving properly. So we tend to end up by always using the minimum, which is 20 megabecals of technician meprofenin. We image anteriorly, and again, we can um, put the child forward first onto the collimator. But the children are often very passive. They're, they're very floppy um, children. They're not screamers. They're not movers. 
And the important thing is to remember that you may need to do a 24 hour image. So do not book these on a Friday unless you work on a Saturday. Uh, and what we're looking for is no evidence of small bowel activity by 24 hours. And that's a positive study. And then the patient needs to go on for urgent operation. So um, the thing is, you may only do one of these in your whole professional life, but that one may be really important to that child's life. So it's, make, it's good to make sure you know what you're doing. So this is a 24-hour image in a child with biliary atresia. This is a, a patient from Addenbrooke's, and you can see that there is good uptake in the liver, um, but there's absolutely no excretion. There will be some bladder activity because there will be some breakdown of protectinitate off of the uh, meprofenin. So don't be fooled by bladder activity. So this is a positive study, and this child needs to go on and have um, surgery fairly urgently. Okay, let's go somewhere different. Let's go for bone imaging. Uh, we've done a lot about bone imaging, so I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. But the, in children, uh, we tend to do dynamic imaging because the kind of things we're looking at are osteomyelitis, avascular necrosis, or primary bone tumors. Um, we may do some static imaging for some childhood cancers, but remember, obviously, epiphyseal uptake. Now, there's a very interesting paper that um, from Red Cross in Cape Town that showed up to 30% of bone syntograms are negative in child osteomyelitis. It appears that children don't have the same kind of response in osteomyelitis or may not have the same kind of response where they get increased uptake of um, tracer. So again, be careful that you don't um, have a negative study. And if the child is still very symptomatic, they should probably go on to MR. And this is not just because of the lack of ionizing radiation, but this is one of the reasons why uh, they tend to have um, MR, not bone scans. But again, for some reason, you may be asked to do the, um, a bone scan. So um, rarely we get asked to do discitis, um, which is a infection that occurs under the age of around about five in the disc between uh, vertebra um, and when you do that when you, when you do that um, primarily we should do bone scanning because discitis can be negative on a white cell study so we had a discussion before we started on whether or not we could go straight to a white cell scan or do uh, MDP discitis is one of those conditions you don't do uh, a white cell scan now obviously in um, present age of 2020 uh, you might want to consider an FDG PET because that will be positive as well um, but again these tend to be uh, diagnosed on MR so may only be um, asked for if MR is not possible um, we've talked about osteosarcoma this is a couple of other examples these are different patients, by the way, because even you can work out that the, um, they're different patients because they clearly can't be the same patient. So um, we may um, scan patients before surgery. So um, this is a teenager, and that's the peak period of time that when you get um, uh, osteosarcoma, as you can see, the patient's fairly large. So we're probably talking about a 14, 15 year old. Look at the epiphyseal plates. You can see that that would be typical for that age. And in the distal um, right femur is an area of intense uptake with expanded bone. That's classically what we see with an osteosarcoma. Uh, the other patient um, has had an amputation for an osteosarcoma in their lower leg. And then they were doing these scans as staging scans. Uh, fortunately, this one's negative. One of the problems, though, obviously, patients who have a prosthesis, uh, sorry, have an amputation and prosthesis um, or uh, a metal plate put in, is you do get some reactive changes around the um, metal plate. Or if they have, for example, this patient has a prosthetic leg, then it changes the mechanics of how they walk. And that can reflect with asymmetrical uptake. Um, so you just have to be aware of that. So, for example, this patient, uh, though they had an amputation, has also had a procedure up here in the femur, and this is post-surgical change. So 
you need to be a bit wary when you're reporting these to make sure you don't report mechanical changes etc as metastasis but normally with osteosarcomas the metastases are very very active another situation which can occur in childhood is congenital hypothyroidism uh, in most countries this is screened for at birth using the um, heel prick test known as the guthrie test and um, this is basically a very simple test just looking for elevated tsh because obviously children shouldn't have uh, hypothyroidism now there are a couple of reasons that this can happen uh, one of the most common could be parental hyperthyroidism which can be occur during pregnancy is not uncommon um, and um, may be missed um, but there could be other causes as well so we can do a thyroid scan and again um, because we don't want the child to go through development with very low um, thyroxine levels which causes all sorts of issues we like to do the scan as soon as possible so as soon as we've had a positive Guthrie test and normally what happens is they do a maternal thyroid function if that's normal then um, we'd like to do a scan so these patient kids we try to scan around about five or six days after birth it's the latest we want to do this because we want to get them on thyroxin ASAP. Um, you can do it with radioiodine, but to be honest, patetinitate is fine. Um, the only time we'd use radioiodine is if we were looking for a, a failure of organification, uh, which is where we know we have a thyroid, but it's not working properly. And that's a bit more of a technical issue, and I'll show you that later. So this is actually from, from radiology. Um, this is just from a paper showing uh, this is a two week old infant, so slightly later than we'd like to see. Very high TSH, a patetinotate scan, and it shows that though the ultrasound showed that there was a thyroid, there's no uptake of traces. So, this is a, a very classically what we could see as a congenital hypothyroidism. The other thing is uh, a lingual thyroid. So, sometimes these uh, children have. Um, um, some problem with their thyroid function, not a complete hypothyroidism, but a partial hypothyroidism. And their only residual thyroid lies within the tongue. And again, it's to do with the development of the thyroid. Um, and you can do it. This is a, um, a th uh, scan. This actually, is, again, is with patetinotate. And here you have a lump at the back of the, the, the tongue. And the reason you do the thyroid scan is that these lumps can be quite symptomatic and very nice surgeons sometimes like to take them out um before they take them out they ask for a thyroid scan just to make sure they're not taking out the only thyroidal tissue um if they are then what they can do is effectively transplant the thyroidal tissue um, um, somewhere where it's less troublesome um Lack of organification is due to an enzyme defect, which means that you can, the child can uh, take up iodine. Uh, their thyroids look normal. They have a normal patetinotate scan, but they're unable to put the iodine onto the colloid, so they can't make the thyroxine. <clears throat> it's rare. I've done four of these tests in 24 years. But you do need to give radioiodine because, as we know, patetinate does not organify. And then what you need to do is um, you can either go, do it orally or IV iodine. Um, um, uptake will depend on working this gene. So if we talked about the NIST gene um, a couple of days ago. So if you don't see any uptake with iodine, then you know that there's a d defect in the NIST gene. If you do see uptake, you know that part's working. You then have to give perchlorate now there is a problem with perchlorate um, hopefully you don't have this in South Africa but um, we have had all our perchlorate taken away because they are worried about a terrorist nuclear attack and they want to keep it for civil defense purposes so you have to apply to the Ministry of Defense to get a dose of perchlorate to do the test uh, also, they think that terrorists who handle radioactive substances will be taking perchlorate to protect themselves. So you have to sort of sign endless documentation and then 
one dose is delivered to you from the chemical warfare unit at the army for you to give to your patient. It takes quite a long time. And what you're looking for is that if there is organification, and that's also why you need to wait um, a bit of time for it to happen, you'll, you won't get washout. But perchlorate displaces the iodine when it's not attached to the colloid. Sometimes this condition is, uh, is related to deafness and then it's called Pendred syndrome. So this is a series of images. So you have uptake here of iodine, uh, the perchlorates being, being given and then it washes out over, uh, this is over 60 minutes. And you can even do a, a curve if you want. In the UK, it's very rare, and um, the only hospital in the south of the country that's allowed to do this is Great Ormond Street's Children's Hospital. In the north, it's Alderhay Hospital, and in Scotland, Glasgow Children's Hospital, and all cases eventually are referred there, partly because they have a secure supply of the chlorate. How about oncology? Well, um, to be honest, oncological imaging is not that different from adults uh, in the um, in the kind of test that we use sadly the the most common use of um, nuclear medicine in um, children and we define a child as anybody under 18 is lymphoma um, and the youngest lymphoma patient I've scanned is eight um, the very young children might require some sedation <coughs> The specialist area is MIBG, imaging for neuroblastoma. These children tend to be a lot, lot younger. Um, and they made, I mean, the youngest I've done is four weeks old. Uh, but most of them are one to two to three years old. So they, again, may need to be done under general anesthetic. These patients can become quite distressed because of their repeat uh, visits. Um, some of the chemotherapy regimes for osteosarcoma uh, can affect kidneys and heart so sometimes you might be doing gfrs and muggers on children and again you might want to use uh, various techniques to help them including local anesthetic cream i know we normally say no local anesthetic cream over the age of 12 some of these children again are pretty traumatized by repeat injections so they may benefit from having it even after 12. Again, remember, you can't use lead clanesthetic cream below the age of one normally. So I do one, two, three, or one, three, one in neuroblastoma. Again, we prefer the one, two, three for dosimetric reasons. However, in many patients, the outcome is so appalling. Um, to be honest, worrying about long-term radiation defects is uh, not necessarily something you need to think about. It is the most common extracranial solid tumour, that's non hematological tumour in children. Um, the population in the UK is about 50, 60 million, so we get 150 new cases a year. So you can work out the proportion for South Africa on your population, possibly slightly higher because you have a much younger population than we have. As we said, half of these appear in children under two. They're a neural crest origin, so they are a neuroendocrine variant. They can occur anywhere along the sympathetic nervous system. Um, they metastasize quite often to bone and liver. <clears throat> this is the structure of iodobenzyl guanidine. It's a, um, a precursor for adrenaline or noradrenaline with obviously it's iodinated. So as I said, we, we tend to prefer iodine one, two, three and uh, for dosimetric reasons and we also have to remember the carer's dosimetry especially these patients may have multiple scans over their life um, we like to give a reasonable amount because 24 hour imaging gives you clear images in four hours in fact i very rarely do the four hour imaging now it just upsets everybody the children the parents you do need to protect the thyroid um, so you do need to give iodine and in children the best method is lugal iodine which you can titrate to their weight uh, again you're trying to give around about the adult equivalent of um, 60 to 70 milligrams of iodine split over three days um, 
and it's easier to hide Lugal Zardin in some um, milk or orange squash or something so that the child doesn't notice they're having it. Interfering drugs, uh, less of a problem in children because they're unlikely to be taking any of these drugs. Uh, they tend to be drugs like um, antihypertensive and antidepressants, which occur in adults. Um, so this is one of my patients from um, Adam Brooks, and you can see the anterior and posterior. And just see just how small this child is. Uh, we've got the whole child in on two views, so they're only about 70 centimetres long. If they're bigger, then you may have to take multiple views. So about 85 to 90 percent have uptake of MIBG. It can be used to look for unexpected sites of disease. Um, if the child is very distressed, image quality might be an issue, and you may need to just stop the scan, get the child sorted out, maybe give them some milk, give them something to calm them down or give them some sedation or even call an anaesthetist and then do the scan. It's not worth just struggling with a child that's very distressed getting a bad quality scan. Um, FDG, uh, increasingly we're beginning to use FDG in neuroblastoma. This is one of our, our children with a FDG scan and this child was MIBG negative. Um, there is also some data that um, dotatate can be useful um, and that might be a possible treatment um, but we failed to get approval for treating children with lutetium dotatate from our um, national ethics committee at present so this is a, um, a very a cannonball lesion in the lung with uptake of, of FDG again with children remember pifocele uptake of FDG uh, don't get confused um, between um, epiphyseal uptake and uh, bone metastasis. The CT component helps with that. I'm going to just finish off with something that's, that's a little bit rare, but a little bit unusual, and um, um, has recently become in news again because um, it's something which there's now a national plan to diagnose. So this is something called hyperinsulinemia. Um, and this can either be focal or diffuse. So um, in young children, you can get a condition where they have high levels of insulin. And this is either due to an insulinoma, a normal neuroendocrine insulinoma, or it can be due to a diffuse condition of the pancreas. Now, the most common one, obviously, is we get in the pancreas is diabetes. Um, with children, of course, we don't we can't really image that people have tried it's not really been successful but we may end up having to do things like gfrs for renal assessment but hyperinsulinemia um as i say can be due to diffuse or focal defect now if it's a focal defect either an insulinoma or a focal pancreatic defect they can have curative surgery so the reason i'm saying this is uh, interesting is that um there's been a project now running for about a decade using F18 DOPA. And it always used to be difficult to get because F18 DOPA uh, was not a licensed or authorized product, but it has just been licensed or authorized for this. So the number of patients, again, for the UK is fairly low, around about 10 patients per year. Uh, but it can be used to find the difference between focal and diffuse. Now, diffuse lesions, there's not much you can do because you can't really take out the whole pancreas because they'll even have even less insulin then. Um, but if it is a focal, then they can have surgery. And this is all based on a publication from um, 11 years ago uh, from University College London and Great Ormond Street in London. And I said it's now been approved across Europe for this indication. So here we have um, um, a couple of these patients. These are two different patients. Um, and you can see this is... Um, the arrow is pointing to focal uptake of F18 DOPA um, in the head of the pancreas. And um, where you do have focal uptake, it tends to be in the head. So these, these children can have effectively a mini whipples uh, and remove this part of the pancreas, which is curative. So it's something which is um, a bit of high tech nuclear medicine, but can be very helpful. But you do need to have a source of F18 DOPA, which clearly uh, can be troublesome to make. Uh, it's a lot more difficult and a lot less stable than FDG. Um, I think. So here we're just going to our summary. So remember that children are not small adults. They do have specific issues. Um, 
when you have younger children, particularly congenital illnesses predominate, which you don't see so much in adults. Be aware of radiation dose, but don't be frightened of radiation dose. Um, it's important that we diagnose these problems, particularly if there is a management for it. And the role of PET in children, both with FDG and other agents, is slowly increasing, but less so and less quickly than in adults. Thank you very much. Let me just stop and I can stop the recording.